speaker is here, Elizabeth Pilt, with Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, her presentation today is, what is the role of ethics in climate change debates? Following her, I wish you were here because I don't want to butcher his name. I hope you can correct me if I get it wrong. Uh, Abby Odun uh, Afalabi is presenting at uh, 1010 with consumer activism toward redirecting the moral economy of food, looking at uh, agriculture practices. So with that, Elizabeth, when you are ready, you can go ahead and share your screen and the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for this introduction. Let me see how I can um, start the presentation. Yeah, um, thanks a lot. So um, in my presentation, I, what I want to do, I, um, based on the UNESCO's Declaration of Ethical Principles in relation to climate change, I would like to reflect on the role these ethical principles have in public debates on climate change and more broadly, the role of applied ethics reflection in debate or in debates on climate change. And the, the this UNESCO declaration is from 2017 and it discusses six principles, prevention of harm, the preca precautionary approach, equity and justice, sustainable development, solidarity and scientific knowledge and integrity. And what I want to do, I want to go through all of them and kind of a little bit discuss about each of them. So the prevention of harm, and, and these are the, some of them have quite a bit of text. So I, I shortened them and for this presentation, basically I just highlighted the, the most important aspects. Um, uh, prevention of harm states and all actors, this declaration is addressed to basically everyone that should take appropriate measures within their powers to formulate and implement policies and actions to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And they should anticipate, avoid, or minimize harm wherever it might emerge from climate change, as well as from climate mitigation, adaptation policies, and actions. So this is pretty general prevention of harm as we know it from other contexts, medical contexts, and so on. So the, the basic question is, why has not more been done in the past to, to prevent harm? Uh, the, on, on the right side, you see a, a title page from a German magazine in 1986, which was quite a while ago, where they had the, 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 the vision of having the Cologne Dome flooded. And uh, why has not more been done to prevent harm? Because we would all agree that prevention of harm is really important. So overall, climate change is a, is a slow development, it seems far away, especially it seemed far away in the past. It's unclear who will be affected. We don't really see immediate effects of our uh, behavior, effects on climate change, neither positive nor negative effects. It's difficult to change accustomed behaviors. That's, that's what, what, what behavioral um, studies shows. And there are a number of conflicts of interest for, of course, for politicians who want to become who wants to be who want to be reelected or I mean all kinds of uh, conflicts of interest. So overall, there is a clear um, problem of climate inaction here. Even though we all agree that it's it's important to prevent harm, I, I would say. So this reminded me of of two debates that that play a role in in the applied ethics uh, debate. The one is a uh, trolley dilemmas, especially the footprint. Uh, bridge dilemma uh, discussion, which indicates that the more actively we are involved in harming someone and the closer the person is, the less we are willing to do so. And I mean, climate change is certainly not about killing someone, but it's, it's about imposing restrictions on people that are closer to us in order to save people that are further away. And the second example I was thinking of uh, is this um, uh, is James Rachels, who in 1975 um, published this very influential article on active and passive euthanasia. I'm not in favor of active euthanasia, don't get me wrong, but this context of killing and letting die, I think it, it does play a role in, in the debate on climate change. Um, the, the, he discussed this, this bathtub example, that's why I chose this picture, um, kind of Smith and Jones, 
um, one seeing um, his nephew die and and doing nothing, uh, die in the bathtub, uh, throw, uh, and 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 not preventing him from dying, and the other one actively throwing um, the nephew to 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 inherit money. And what what Rachel stresses is in this context. I mean, as I said, it's a difficult debate, but still, um, he stresses there's no morally significant difference between killing and letting die. Um, in the context of uh, this bathtub situation. And I mean, it's a difficult debate. It's, it's, it's a lot of factors play in here, but for sure it, it plays a role that, that there's, uh, when we would, would think about, we don't want to actively kill the environment. It, it, would, be, it would be different. We have a different conception of this killing and letting die also in the context of climate change that we think when we do nothing, it's not, that blameworthy, it's not such a moral problem, but actually it is. So I think the debate would need a reframing in the sense of not thinking about what are the factors that prevent us from doing something, but what are factors that could make behavioral change easier. And this could be a, 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 a thing, a, a context to think about. And also um, to, to, to stress that uh, taking preventive steps is not primarily about losing something because we always think, oh yeah, when when we think about climate change, we have to we have to restrict ourselves. But it's about winning a better future. So refraining could really help in this context because it's up to us to change our behavior. We should not so much try to find plausible explanations for why we are not doing anything, but we should think about what can how can we support us doing something. So the next uh, principle is a precautionary approach, uh, which reads in the, in the de UNESCO declaration, where there are threats of serious or irreversible harm, a lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to anticipate, prevent, or minimize the causes of climate change and mitigate its adverse effects. So, um, which is an, I, I would say it's an important principle, I, uh, but, it's, it's remarkable that it's framed, it's framed very differently from how the precautionary principle normally is being framed, uh, which is more in the context of, which is in the, in, in the, more in the context of people wanting to, to, to um, uh, build something. And let me just read what I've written there. Uh, the precautionary principle, which normally is in, in the concept, context that if there is a system suspicion that a certain action goes along with the risk of causing harm to the environment or to the public, those who plan to take the action have the burden of proof that it is not harmful. And normally this precautionary principle is, is used in the, uh, for risk management in the context of uncertain or unknown outcomes of decision in, in the concept, context of um, uh, uncertainty where we don't know about the outcomes or about the, the, the probability of, of those outcomes. And it serves to prevent possible serious or irreversible harm, ir irreversible harm to the public. It has four components. The first one, the need to take preventive measures in, if faced with, with uncertainty. Uh, the second one, if, uh, if there's lack of scientific evidence, the burden of proof is on those who plan to do something that may be harmful to, to everyone, to the people, to, to, to people, to the environment. And the, the third component to investigate a broad spectrum of alternative routes for action. And the fourth one to increase the extent to which the public is involved in decision making. So it's a very, has these four components. Uh, the advantage clearly is it helps to, uh, uh, to take, uh, to, to, avoid harm to the public. Basically, that's the same as prevent harm as the first principle they had. Uh, and by stressing responsible, responsibility for society as a whole or for worldwide responsibility, it favors laws and policies that serve to protect human health and the environment if, if uh, in face of uncertainty. And of course, the problem of, of this principle is uh, that it tends to, 
delay or suppress technological innovation and progress because it focuses on uncertainties. And of course, you can always say, oh, we are, cannot really be sure that there are negative consequences. And so far, it tends to delay uh, developments, which is a which is which certainly is a problem. Um, someone who has not used the term precautionary principle, uh, but who, who, who coined this term of heuristics of fear, which basically is a similar approach is Hans Jonas in his uh, book, The Imperative of Responsibility. Um, he stressed that modern technology has far reaching implications for future generations and that this comes with new di dimensions of responsibility. And what he stressed is that, that, that it's important to, 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 when we think of this, that to have a prevalence of the bad over the good prognosis, to always think about what can go wrong and to focus on this, so to be prepared for the worst, basically. And what he called this a heuristics of fear, which is sort of, it's, it's not the same as, as a precautionary principle, but it's somehow related. And the problem of these two principles for sure is that they are not very attractive. They, it, it's not really good to, to have fear, to, to, to be afraid of things, to be precaution, to, to have this precautionary um, perspective. And that's, that's what, what, what we could see in, in, in this tweet by Trump. And maybe you remember this. Um, I've retrieved this from the Trump archive because it's no, lot of, no longer online. The, this tweet, tweet to Greta Thunberg when, when Trump wrote, oh, so ridiculous, Greta must work on her, her anger management problem. Then go to a good old fashioned movie with a friend. Chill, Greta, chill. So that's, that's basically the problem. It's not, not considered to be brave or cool or, or attractive to, to, to fear things, to have this precautionary approach. And I think, again, there's a need to reframe this, to, to, to stress that precaution and fear are not signs of weakness that is crucial to think ahead and that there is courage needed to make unpopular decisions because this is actually a pretty brave approach to make unpopular decisions in, in this uh, situation. So let me see how much time I've left. Um, so um, the next principle is equity and justice. Um, it's a long, it's a long uh, text. Justice in relation to climate change requires fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. And they stress that it's, it's of particularly of particular, it's particularly re re relevant to do this in solidarity with the poorest and most vulnerable uh, people. They stress present and future generations, and they stress, which is really. Um, remarkable they have a whole paragraph that measures should be taken into account measures should take into account the contributions of women in decision making since women are disproportionately affected and since women have a, an important role in this context and we all agree that that justice is central i mean for sure nobody would deny this but there are a number of, of problems in, in the public debate. The one is that it's often framed in the context of we versus them, the North versus the South, rich versus poor countries, advantage versus disadvantaged regions, older versus younger generation, this whole generational conflict kind of plays a huge role here. Then what is the role of the, the, the past, uh, colonialism, uh, Western people, Western countries, uh, build having built their wealth on on other countries then how, the, how what's the role of the past present and future and and how to how to balance this so so there are there are a lot of problems here and for sure i don't have any answer or any solution but it will be important to, to really think in, in more detail about what are suitable criteria for just distribution of resources who makes the decisions who is responsible what is the role of the past in all of this? What is, how can we balance current and future needs and how can future generations be adequately considered? These are all pretty open questions right now and they need more applied ethics input. I'm convinced of this. There is an approach that has been uh, referred to, um, John Rawls' theory of justice, the veil of ignorance, you, you may be familiar with this, this idea of, of people making decisions decisions in the state where they where they are behind a, a veil that where they don't know what their, their social role will be what 
would, and, and this could be an approach, but I'm sure uh, even, the, even this approach would need some elaboration, but I'm sure there, there are others uh, that could be useful in doing this for us. So uh, the sustainability, uh, sustainable development uh, principle is the next one. Uh, basically, uh, they state that uh, what is important for actors is to promote the implementation of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its Sustainable Development Goals. And it's a it's a long uh, it's a long text. I've I've short it. I apologize. And they say that they, it's also important to tackle the adverse effects of climate change in areas that deserve special attention due to the human, humanitarian implications and consequences. And then they mention uh, all these uh, contexts, food, energy, water, insecurity, and so on. And yeah, for sure, this is very important. Uh, here are the 17 uh, sustainable uh, development goals from the United Nations from 2015. They are all very important for sure. Zero hunger, um, quality education, gender equality. Um, you see principle 13 is climate action. 14, for example, life below water, 50 life on land. And once we have a closer look at, at, at them, it's pretty obvious that Climate action is not just one of them, but basically climate action covers all of them, isn't it? It could even be considered a meta principle if, if we want so, or at least they are so so interconnected that, I mean, to think of climate change as principle, as goal 13 is, is may not be enough, I, I would suggest. And then there are a number of other problems around sustainable development. The one is our tendency to, of temporal discounting of kind of, uh, giving less weight to, to, to the future. I have an example here, this from the European Union, but this is true for, for really each and every country. For example, they have the aim to be carbon not neutral by 2050, which is almost in, in almost 20 years. And I mean, I don't know what, what you think, but how old am I by, by 2050? Um, what am I going to be interested in? So there are a lot of interest, uh, issues here regarding to diachronic identity and this this uh, this question of future self selves Derek Parfit has famously discussed this idea of future selves am I still uh, interested in my future self in 20 years am I still responsible am I responsible for my past self so this idea of diachronic identity does play a, a, a huge role and it has to be stressed that it's not about the distant future but that we have to continue right now uh, changing things in 2022 in order to be on track for 2050 basically and I mean we have to to it, it's not about distant goals so this this is a huge problem and then um, another problem of course is the the immediate problems we are faced with uh, move the focus and the resources away from fighting climate change I mean we see this with the Russian attack on 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 Ukraine uh, but also with flooding, all kinds of destructions, drought, uh, famine, and, and ironically, in, in part, they are caused by, by climate change. So this is a, a vicious circle, basically. We, we, there are problems occurring, but we, we, they, we always have to deal with the immediate problems, and, and, and this, this may, may move the, the, the focus away from, from the, the real problem. And of course, the tendency to con continue as usual. Oh yeah, and here I have an, 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 an another example, uh, a sustainable development. One idea is, is carbon off offsetting. Um, uh, Shell has, has this uh, offered for their business partners uh, that, that, that you drive carbon neutral, that, that, that you continue driving your, 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 your car, your, your cars, your, your fleet, and, and just uh, offset this by paying for, for, for projects that serve the environment. The same with atmosphere and the idea of, uh, of offsetting your, your flight. I mean, I've done this too, but basically the, these are not really uh, uh, things that help the development because they just, uh, make us continue with what we, we keep doing and, and, and just perpetuates our, our behavior and we may feel less blameworthy and yeah it's, it's somehow good to to offset uh, 
our flights and, and, and it's, it's better to do nothing. But in, in what we really have to do, we have to change our behavior, isn't it? And one approach that uh, company atmos uh, NGO atmosphere has is, is it, 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 it supports a lot the development of synthetic kerosene, which may be another way out. But sustainable development is, is about changing behavior and not about continuing what we have been doing all the time. Solidarity, I, I have to... Um, is, is about people working uh, together implies that human beings collectively and individually should assist people and groups that are most vulnerable to climate change and natural disasters. And that is not just about uh, humans, but also um, in uh, solidarity with, with other organisms, ecosystems, and the environment, and also future generations. The solidarity principle is, is particularly long. And sure, solidarity is super important. It helps to overcome these divisions I've mentioned in the beginning about the we against them, and it helps to overcome intergenerational conflicts. It helps to balance this, to counterbalance this focus on individual autonomy. Um, that's also been very strong in applied ethics. Um, and it motivates climate activism. It helps to overcome this inactivism. And so far, it's, it's really important. Yes, it's really important. But on the other hand, there are also um, um, developments in, in that, that may cause concern. For example, Andreas Malm has published this book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And what he does, he says, OK, those fossil fuel companies, they don't change their behavior. Politics doesn't do any so thing. So it's on us to, 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 to do something to, to, uh, with our actions, with, with our bodies, to diffuse and destroy uh, the tools that of these companies. We need, in, in short, to start blowing up some oil pipelines. I mean, this is also something you can try to legitimate with this, this idea of solidarity. And, and, and this, of course, uh, uh, brings up the, the, the question, what are legitimate forms of climate action and how far is solidarity something that, 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 that legitimate, or how, how far does solidarity legitimate um, uh, Act, what type of, 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 of actions does it legitimize? So scientific um, um, science and scientific integrity, um, it's important decision-making based on science and the highest standards of research integrity, they, they stress this, they, it's, a long, it's a long principle. I, I have to go through this very fast. Of course, scientific science quality, scientific integrity is extremely important. Um, but the problem is that it doesn't that that, that there is some politicization uh, going um, going on. I have here a, a, a figure on the esti estimated percentage of people of in, in the United States that think that global warming warming is happening at all. And you can see clearly that it depends on the, the beliefs people have. Clearly depends on whether they are Democrats or Republicans. Uh, Democrats uh, think to a much higher percentage that climate global warming is happening. So there's a lot of uh, politicization going on. It's it's not just about uh, the, the the quality of science. Uh, science has a huge role there. There's a lot of sci science out there, a lot of scientific knowledge, but it also has to be um, promoted in an adequate way. Uh, so uh, my conclusion, uh, the, the UNESCO principles, they are a good start, but in order to be more useful in this complex societal reality, they certainly need much more specification and uh, from a broader perspective, uh, much better integration of the applied ethics perspective in public debate is needed in order to provide this, in order to help us move the debate um, forward. So that's basically my, my presentation. Uh, my conclusion and um, um, yes. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions, comments, concerns. Well, thank you very much Elizabeth for that great overview of all the pressing concerns that we have with climate change and the role ethics plays in those. See, we already have a hand raised so we will get into it. Um, Anyone online, go ahead and post any comments you have or raise a hand, unmute, and we will get to your questions and comments during this. First up, I see David, and David, go ahead.
Thank you for your presentation. Um, climate change is a very, very difficult problem. And it's not going to be solved quickly. Um, a lot of the things you're talking about, like blowing up pipelines, um, <laughs> don't think that's really the way to get there. Um, when you do things like that, what you end up doing is you have a tremendous impact on the poor people. Those are the people that tend to suffer under kinds of policies like increasing uh, prices of gasoline and fuel and cutting off um, things like that. The, the poor people suffer the most because of the regressive effects of the price of energy. Um, it seems to, and I'll just throw in a figure in here, even though we had the pandemic the last two years, it actually made very little difference in terms of our carbon emissions. They went down um, about 6% during the initial lockdowns, but then they bounced back. Um, so what that tells me is that you actually have to have major transformations in uh, energy technology, renew, uh, renewables, non uh, alternative sources of energy. And the thing about that is you can't force science to happen faster than it does. A lot of these things that we need to have happening, like uh, better, more efficient solar power and wind power and uh, um, alternative, you know, more efficient alternative sources of fuel, those are not going to happen overnight. Those, those are, you can't make that happen. Just cutting off the pipeline or increasing the price of gas by, say, 500% is not going to make all of a sudden turn you into a green economy. That takes a lot of time. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that a lot of the proposals that are out there are not very realistic. You have a lot of people that are jumping up and down and getting frantic about climate change, but they don't really understand how complex and difficult the problem is and how it, it really is going to take a tremendous amount of cooperation around the world and cooperation between not only businesses, but all governments and businesses and everyone. It's a huge problem. I absolutely agree. I mean, I absolutely agree. Um, I absolutely agree. I guess what motivated me to this presentation and to begin working in, in this field are two things. Um, the one, and, and it, I think it's in line with what you said. Uh, the one is there have been these ethics debates ongoing in, in bioethics, in medical ethics, and we have to, and, and, and they have, were very important. And I think it will be important to have these, um, these debates, these considerations or related considerations, new considerations be play a, a larger role in the public debate, because I think there is a way ethics, applied ethics can positively influence this debate. And you're right, all of this takes time. And especially these theoretical humanities debates, they take enormous amount of time. And this is somehow sad because there will not be any positive or any influence in the short term. I agree, this is really a huge problem, but we need some change in some way. And the other thing that really uh, that really struck me when I saw this, you know, that originally this what I originally saw was a Guardian article by this by by what's his name by by this uh, 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 Andreas Mom um, author about saying yeah we have to attack these pipelines and everything but what I really realized he is a he is someone who in the public debates brings up um, 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 ethics, moral, I, I, I should have brought the original um, uh, Guardian title. Wasn't it in the title that we have a moral responsibility to attack these pipelines? And I thought, okay, now um, people like, I mean, a lot of people don't really talk publicly about applied ethics in, in this context, but now people who, 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 who are, um, um, who, who argue in, 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 in favor of of, um, I mean, I shouldn't say, ex yeah, I could say it, extreme activism, extreme uh, positions. Now they, they raise their voice in order to support um, um, 
let's say illegal uh, climate activism, illegal activities. And, and, and there I thought, okay, we should not leave the field to, to or I should not leave the field to, to them. I should raise my voice and I should start thinking about this. What is going wrong here? That on the one hand, people like me are not really, I mean, it's not about me, but uh, uh, these positions, this, these general reflections are not really out in, in the debate on this topic. And on the other hand, from, from a really ex extreme side, um, people begin arguing about ethics. It's about, it's our ethical duty to, to do this. And this really struck me. And, and I think that that's something I, that motivated me to do this. But apart from this, well, I truly really agree with what you say. Yeah, uh, I mean, maybe the role of the <laughs> ethics here is to point out that I can't, you know, say basically, I also care about climate change. I want to do something about it, positive and realistic. But blowing up pipelines is not the answer. Yeah, um, sure. Of you're just going to alienate the other side and, and really piss off a lot of people and not really get any positive action on it. It doesn't seem to be the way to go. Of I think course, there's been no, too much I... extremism on both sides of this debate. I agree. I agree. But I think the, the, um, um, the activists, they, 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 they are getting more and more aggressive, isn't it, right now? I absolutely agree that this is not the way out, that there have been that we have to find other ways out. I absolutely agree. I didn't want to promote any uh, any legal actions for this. Don't get me wrong. Um, yes. Somebody else had a question, I think. Yes. Uh, so we are at 9.10. However, I don't see our other speaker at the moment. For the sake of uh, this discussion, though, let's, uh, if anyone has other questions, let's certainly dive into them. I see Shelby has one in the uh, chat with uh, Shelby, do you want to unmute and state your question? I see you also posted a link with the Guardian as well. Oh, I see. Uh, so in the chat, she said, I'm in total agreement that an applied ethics perspective is necessary. Uh, she's wondering if you could address what legitimate climate activism uh, is from this perspective. And then she also listed a link to the Guardian, um, which is the moral case for destroying fossil fuel infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, um, I don't have any clear answers towards what I would think is, is legitimate climate activism. I, um, what I have thought about is why, I mean, it, it begins with, with raising questions like who is in charge, who is responsible, who is making the decisions, what is, was this, what is, um, what is just distribution in, in this context? Uh, think about uh, uh, all kinds of approaches about, about, about justice and, and what can this mean in the context of, of climate change? How can we, um, future generations, what, what, are, what are ways to, to include them? Can they have rights? How, how, how can, I mean, there are a lot of questions here, isn't it? There are a lot of, a lot of philosophical, legal, uh, legal philosophy, a lot of philosophical, ethical questions here that, 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 that play a role here and, and that will have that it will be very useful to, to talk about and to 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 stress that, that that they play a role. Why do we talk about ethics and the, the what was the title the moral case for, for destroying I, I I've read the title I, I should have brought the title. Uh, why 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 is why do we talk about ethics or why is, is, is there an awareness of ethics in this context of, 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 of um, aggressive climate activism? Why do we read a, have, a, have, a, have a headline, the moral case for destroying X? I mean, can't we, can't we have a debate about ethics in this context that is more useful? Maybe that's my point. I, I, I can't, I, I, of course, or not of course, I mean, I, 
I, I, I, I, I believe in democracy. I think everything should be legal. People shouldn't do anything illegal. People shouldn't shouldn't uh, destroy. Uh, you, you know, I mean, it, I mean, you asked about about legitimate climate activism. It, yeah, it, it should clearly be within the within the, the, the legal uh, confinement. It, it should it should not be Ill, illegal. It should not not destroy. Um, um, what others possess. I mean, but these are very general. Um, even this would, would require, would, would we, we could think about what, what are criteria uh, for this, what, what, are, what are criteria for, for legitimate climate activism. And if we think a while about it, we, I, mean, I don't have an immediate solution, but what, what are legitimate things there will inform consent will play a role that, that everyone knows what the, we, we, the, there are a lot of factors that, that play in here. Uh, the, the law, uh, the, uh, consent, um, a number of factors, we, we would have to think about it, but that's exactly what, what, I, what, I, what I want to raise awareness to that. Uh, yeah, the, the, the debate, debate should be could be much broader and, and there could be a lot of input from I mean I'm I've been or I I've I've been in, in, in the field of bioethics, so I'm I'm more familiar with, with this context. But of course there has been have been a lot of debate on on, on in, in the field of environmental ethics, animal ethics. I mean th there are a lot of, of debates that, that could be made more useful in, in this context. Shelby uh, posted an additional comment in the chat. So it seems there is a disconnect between the morality and or ethics of the law in this case. Some, some climate activists believe disobeying the law in this case is in itself the morally right thing to do. So kind of what I'm seeing is, and, and feel free to address that as well, uh, I kind of see two different spectrums where people either don't believe in climate change or maybe at a point where it is something they can't really think about. Maybe they are subsistence living and are simply meeting their needs on a very basic level to the other spectrum where I think you pointed to that article just to get people thinking about what is going on with uh, climate activism in the sense that fossil fuel companies oftentimes can go about their practices, whether that's extracting resources in the way it degrades uh, biodiversity as well as the landscape uh, and simply pay penalty fees while reaping profit. So I see climate activists are essentially trying to make gains when legally there's not much they can do. So we kind of have two different spectrums there. And then if you want to uh, reply to what Shelby stated there. Right, and the fees are minuscule compared to the profit, so they can essentially pay their way out. Yeah, maybe you want to unmute yourself and talk. I think this could be easier instead of, you know, me, just me talking. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's this discrepancy between moral, the moral aspect, the, the legal aspect, and the ethical reflection on, on this. And the the wealth and the power and I mean yeah I mean the that's that's what made me think when when I read the solidarity principle yeah solidarity is really important I mean sure but how far does it go and if we think of we have a real sincere uh, responsibility to prevent harm and we think of we have a solidarity is really very important People may up, may end up with with the idea of of um, let's say illegal climate activism. Um, um, just to note, Shelby, I think she's eager to join and unmute, but she noted she is in a public space where it's a bit noisy. Otherwise, she would yeah, unmute and do I, so. Maybe I have. To to, may I have, maybe I have to stop sharing my screen and 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 have a sure. that I can better see what what she wrote because I I it's just I it was too much to be honest I I can't okay. um, shall it shall be
no it's here so it seems that there is a disconnect yeah yeah uh, we do have one uh, chat by the, the reality of, I mean, I'm not a climate activist, but the mere fact that the word climate activist is now something we consider in a totally negative, uh, uh, with a negative connotation is also a problem, isn't it? I mean, these, the, the, the Fridays for Future um, movement, we, we owe them a lot that they, 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 they raise public awareness. Um, and I understand that there is an increasing frustrating, frustration among them that they are not better heard or that, that they, are, they are not better considered, especially as they, they, are, they are the future somehow compared to me or us who are much older and, and so far. And it, it may be just that their reaction to, to um, uh, feel that obeying the law, having been in line with the law has did not help. So maybe they tried disobeying the law, but uh, I agree this in this is not the way out it, in quite in contrast, this will, will cause a, a lot of additional problems. Um, yeah. We do have one in the chat by Steve, but before we get there, uh, let, Chelsea has had her hand up for a bit. So let's get to uh, Chelsea, did you have a comment or a question? Please go ahead. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of, um, of uh, investor activists and this big move of money to uh, ESG investments um, and big asset managers like BlackRock uh, really championing te technological advances and, and other advances related to ESG. Um, and I, I do, I also, I was thinking about the Edelman trust barometer that comes out annually. And uh, we've had this switch in trust of society from the government to business where, where society is trusting business more than it does um, the government. And if that is where, you know, we need to really focus on, um, on the power of that capital um, that the companies need. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a lot of power, conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, I agree. Uh, what I realized is that uh, with this debate and what I wouldn't have expected, um, how to how to say this? Um, yeah, it's a lot about the societal situation, isn't it? It's a lot about what's going on in society. It's a lot about the societal reality, and that we are somehow stuck in the societal reality, and how to have change. And I mean, David stressed this: it will be difficult to have change. We are stuck here somehow, uh, illegal activity may not be a, be a way out. What is the role of academic reflection here? What is I, the role I, of that? Is there a role at all, isn't it? I mean, all your, all your comments are more about, you know, this is the reality, this is how it is, this is the power of the cop. I mean, this is all true, you know? I have no, I, I have no, I can't say anything else. It's all I true. Know it, you know, it's just interesting to think about um, the different elements. I mean, it's a big, messy problem. And um, how do you really affect change? You know, we saw with the pandemic how quickly, tech, you know, innovation created a vaccination. Um, how do we translate that into climate change? So it becomes that, um, that focus, right, of advancement and innovation. Yeah. Yeah. That's another field we could borrow from, isn't it? We could, we could use, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this input and comment. So I don't know if you saw the comment by Steve. Hi, Steve, I'm just reading. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Sarah Ray, who has written a book on the emotional emotions of climate change. She just spoke this past week in the University of Central Florida's ethics speaker series 
called ethically speaking. Dr. Ray advanced to the point, if I may paraphrase, paraphrase that extreme emotions on the subject push both activists and denier to inaction. Yeah, 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 that's a really great point. So learning to handle these emotions is important for progress on climate change. It's an interesting view on what drives polarization that prevents a kind of individual and institutional change needed to address the problem. Yeah, this is a great point. You are, you are absolutely right. And Dr. Ray sure is absolutely right. I will read something. I will read uh, uh, what she has published. That's, 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 that's true. I mean, emotions won't help. Um, or they, they may push us, uh, yeah. And, and I mean, that's true. We have talked about the activists and the, the, the disobeying activists. We have not really talked about the deniers yet. I mean, that could be another side. Um, yeah, but that's another, that's in addition is, doesn't it, 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 doesn't it the more support this approach of trying to think about um, philosophical, ethical, um, based uh, theory based approaches to this problem, even though this may take time and even though this may seem like an academic uh, thing that may not be useful in the, or I mean, I don't want to phrase it in the negative way, but this, this will take time and we won't see an immediate effect on this. Steve, you, maybe you. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. I, I really enjoyed it. And I also appreciated uh, David Resnick's uh, comments and, you know, a little bit of healthy pushback there. As much as I was uh, profoundly impacted and um, a strong supporter of, of Dr. Ray's arguments in her book, in her talk, it's so interesting. One of the things that she talks about are the emerging uh, or clarified connections between climate change and other social justice issues, such as racism. And that, that struck me so oddly, because I think on the academic plane and the analytical plane, it's probably true. But if you want to deter people from having anything to do with climate change, tell them it's about racism. I mean, that will further polarize the debate and the discussion. So the question was asked, what can academics do? I think we have to be very thoughtful and focused about how we address the problem. Although there may be an, an intellectual connection between the core problem and other societal issues and those you know, are very worthwhile exploring. We should not add uh, fuel to the fire that's increasing the carbon footprint, right? By giving uh, an already polarized society a reason to further reject the issues of climate change. So I, I, I you know, I, her book was very profound and I loved her talk and I hope everyone will go visit our website, I'm partly promoting our website uh, and, and see, the, see the talk. But I just thought it was such a daft argument to start trying to make those connections um, because we have to be smart about what we're doing. And we also have to be very informed. I'm actually a chemist um, and I do research in optical materials. And I can tell you the science is not that far behind. Uh, there are ways to do it. It's about economic incentivizing and it's about shifting paradigms, but it's only gonna happen on the individual level. Certainly in our society where there's such a strong uh, thread of, of liberalism and that's true to even other societies, Germany, for example, Look at the anti-vax movement that's been so strong. I hear it in Deutsche Welle every morning. Um, you really have to drive individual change. And I can't, I almost cannot go to the grocery store without having more mass in packaging than in produce. So single-use plastics is way off the chart. And you know, I I almost cannot go to a market for there is no market where I can carry things home in a bag as I could when I lived in England. So it, it really is going to require very expensive individual change to then drive societal change. This perception that there's going to be a top down change driven by institutions, I think, is uh, just just impossible. It, it ignores the reality of the world we're in. See, so, yeah. Elizabeth, do you want to comment or? Yeah, and then we have uh, David with his hand up after. Thank you. I agree. I mean, you're right. Um, you're right. It's on us, on each of us to change our behavior in some way. And I'm trying this too. Plastic. I mean, all of these things you mentioned, I absolutely agree. Um, I absolutely agree. On the other hand, this is exactly the trajectory that, that, that seems to legitimize people to to, to blow up fuel, fossil fuel companies, isn't I mean, uh, I agree, I agree. Um, 
yeah, maybe David, maybe you, maybe it's your turn. I've talked a lot. It's not that I have a lot of solutions. I just want to uh, <laughs> see what we can achieve, moderate the discussion, think about how to, how to move forward. David, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't get away from the economics of the situation, which drives individual behavior. Um, it's not really gonna, you're not gonna have major change until um, these alternative sources of uh, energy are cheaper than fossil fuels. You can't get away from that cost consideration until the price for ordinary consumers, they decide, yes, I really would like to have an electric car because this is cheaper and um, power companies decide they'd like to go solar because it's cheaper and things like that. You really have to, the economics has to be there for this really to happen on a big scale. Um, and it's, I, you know, obviously innovation is huge driver in this in terms of bringing down the cost of these other fuels, but um, it's just, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's going to take some time. Um, another huge factor you cannot ignore in all this is population growth, um, which is going to continue to drive the whole system, even if uh, people are in a more developed countries are reducing their carbon footprint. We have a lot of developing, you know, other developing countries are in increasing their population. You also cannot ignore uh, geopolitics where you have countries that um, may not really care much about climate change. Uh, they may say they do uh, for political reasons, but what they really care about maybe is global conquest or power or something like that. Um, so it's a big problem. I do think justice is a big is a big issue in all this, but I also agree that's not necessarily strategically, rhetorically, <laughs> a good way to argue for the problem. I, I think it, it ends up being very divisive. I think probably the strategically the best way to try to support climate change policies it's, is to say that it's in everybody's interests. Um, and it's the interest of the future generations and things like that, not that it's a particular uh, unfairness between North and South or between different races or whatever. You start making that kind of an argument, I think I agree earlier, it's gonna be extremely divisive and probably counterproductive it just is in terms of rhetoric, even, even if it happens to be true. Yeah, you're right. It's in everyone's interest and also this intergenerational conflict. I mean, we are all part of families. A lot of us have kids. So, and I mean, there are a lot of factors that, that could be stressed instead. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. So I've got a talk at 11 o'clock on environmental justice and the climate and climate change. I hope some of you will come to that and yeah, I'll be there. You have to say about it. <laughs> I saw this. Yeah, I'm very looking, much looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks a lot for for all your thoughts and and contributions. That's that's a huge problem, obviously. We have you ever read any of uh, Bjorn Longboard's stuff on climate change and things like that? The The Economist. The skeptical environmentalist. You ever read that stuff? Yeah. Can you put it in no. the chat? Yes. Can you put hmm? it in the chat, perhaps? Uh, let me see. So while you're doing that, I see Steve has a hand up here. Steve, do you have a comment or a question? Yeah, just listening to the discussion so far, I was thinking, um, trying to answer the question, what can academics do? 
Um, I wonder if academics need to connect more to the, the money climate investors and encourage them to put their funds in supporting the development of technologies which enable individuals to make these choices. Because some of the investment is really focused more on large scale projects, um, you know, the infrastructure, things that are more at the institutional level rather than the individual level. Um, to some extent, maybe you could argue, well, isn't that what an electric vehicle is all about? But I, I don't think so um, in that instance because it, the, the infrastructure is fundamentally limited in terms of charging stations and that sort of thing. And also, um, I, 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 I think it's an open-ended question as to whether electric vehicles with the front-end manufacturing costs really are carbon neutral. Um, certainly, ethanol is not carbon neutral. In fact, it's probably more expensive and yet that gets pushed as a solution. But if for example, there were technologies to reduce the cost of solar installation, that might help at the individual level. Because if you go to do solar, really only about a fourth of the cost is the solar cells. So if you improve the efficiency of solar cells, you've impacted a quarter of the cost. Half of the cost is installation. So if there were systems that enabled the, the barrier to um, implementing sustainable energy at the house and individual level, that might help. And maybe what academics can do is connect better in their communication to the moneyed investors who want to make a difference with their investment to focus on those kinds of initiatives rather than large scale top down solutions. Yeah, this, I mean, solar panels, just to discuss that example, um, it's, it's not entirely clear whether they're a net benefit to the environment or not, um, because you have um, hazardous materials in the solar cells themselves, um, heavy metals and uh, toxic metals that are used in solar cells. And there's a really big issue in, in terms of how long they last. That's a huge problem. You put all these solar panels on your roof and you're told that they're gonna last 20 or 30 years and they only last you know, five to 10 years. Then you've got all this stuff you have to take off your roof and it goes into the waste dump somewhere. Um, and you've actually not really done good for the environment at all. So I, I'm totally a big believer in, in these green technologies, but this stuff has to be smart. Um, I think a lot of the green technologies that are being sold are being sold because they can be sold and um, people are not they're not all they're cracked up to be, a lot of them um, have to be smart about it. Well, so not to this... hijack the conversation, but it, it really depends upon what the technology is. I mean, if you go out and buy standard solar cells, they're either silicon or polycrystalline silicon. And so the majority of the material is actually not toxic. Some interconnects maybe, but it, it, the same is true for consumer electronics. They're filled with beryllium, for example, which is toxic. So your standard silicon solar cells are actually not that big of a deal. Some alternative technologies and things that are used in higher end applications may contain things like cadmium sulfide. And I think they're a non-starter. There's a lot of research going on into these materials called perovskites that contain lead. And I think, frankly, it's stupid. Um, but silicon solar cells are actually a pretty good solution. They lose about 1% per year. They really do last 20 to 30 years. Um, that's actually a pretty good solution, but it's about real estate, homeowners associations, cost of installation, um, selling back power and balancing load, and that gets more to the infrastructure, and then technologies for energy storage. So improving lithium batteries so that you can balance load. So I, I, I think actually that's not that big of a problem with, with current technologies. That's just my thought. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I agree. But, you know, people are interested in things like, you know, biofuels and whatnot. And I, I think it doesn't really solve the problem. It's still, it's still a net carbon output. Uh, CO2 sequestration, I think, is the biggest hoax. It's, it's just ridiculously stupid from the standpoint of energetics. And oh, so yeah. It, 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 putting too much energy into the system. It's, it's, it's a panacea. Really... And it gives the climate activist, maybe, who's interested in technology, the feeling that with technology, we can solve a problem. Well, it depends on what you actually do. It still allows, to Elizabeth's point, it still allows the fossil fuel companies to keep on making fossil fuels and feel good about it because they're investing in CO2 carbon capture. It's, what about re, re, what about reforestation and oh. uh, plant plant you know planting uh, grasses in the deserts and and you know just using biologic? I, I'll let you speak. 
Oh, I, I mean, I think all of those things are important and good. And, and even further research is emerging that maybe uh, a large majority of our CO2 capture is not necessarily happening on land, but on sea, you know, either in, in poor and bad forms, which leads to acidification or in terms of algal CO2 capture. So we're really actually starting to understand our biosphere a lot better as we study this problem. And I, for me, to, to Elizabeth's point, that's one of the primary reasons for people to get involved in this and understand the problem is that we really don't know enough about the problem, much less how to solve it and, and you know what the dynamics are. I mean, it really is an issue of we just simply don't know. Um, and so it should, be, oh, it should give us a watch uh, word to potential solutions, like solutions of dispersing reflectance into the atmosphere to throw heat back. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard about. That's tantamount to introducing hairs into Australia to deal with, you know, rodent problems. Now you suddenly have a rodent hair problem, right? You know, we make these kinds of changes thinking we're going to solve one problem. We end up creating another when fundamentally we don't know enough about what our current impacts are. And that's where the research needs to focus. And, and I really think where we focus R&D, it needs to enable uh, the consumer to make those kinds of difficult choices at a cost-effective level. Because your your point, David, is is well made that it's it, we've got to can, we've got to recognize the economics of the problem. So I've got to jump in, do my duty as chair. Uh, we are at time for the block session, and I want to thank uh, Elizabeth for yeah, giving an excellent presentation, diving into a great discussion here and answering some tough questions. Do you have any closing remarks or comments you would like to make, Elizabeth? I just want to thank everyone for their uh, contributions, for their comments, for their thoughts, for their links, for their discussions. I will read those books and, and I'm looking forward to David's talk in, in, the next in the next session, basically. And thank you, everyone.